Uh, I've always been a firm believer that uh, repetition is the mother of learning. So uh, we're going to get started. Let me just get my PowerPoint up here and uh, share it. All righty, can you see that on the screen? Yes. yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Let's get started. All righty. Uh, that, uh, by the way, is the same bird picture at, uh, that I see on my, uh, my home screen here. So uh, you don't see my uh, cluttered den. Uh, it, by the way, it was taken at uh, Sweetwater Wetlands. Uh, I think that was taken back uh, in 2019. But uh, moving on to the first actual slide, uh, this, uh, the title is Bird Photography Tips and, uh, Tips and Tricks or Techniques. Uh, but we're going to talk about multiple things. We're going to talk about uh, gear. Uh, we'll talk about it in a little different context. We generally talk, generally uh, talk in a general way about gear on our first lecture. This time we'll talk a little bit more specifically to certain situations. We're also going to uh, visit our old friend, the uh, um, uh exposure triangle and uh, camera settings. Uh, then of course, again, we're going to talk about uh, images or tips for creating interesting images. Uh, what's fascinating is, is my area of, of passion, obviously, is birds. Uh, what is fascinating is to see the different expressions and, and uh, uh, presentation they make personality-wise. Uh, and the last thing we're going to do is talk about uh, having some fun with it. Uh, the picture on the left is on the bottom is the elegant trogan, which uh, is frequently located up in uh, uh, Madeira Canyon. Uh, my wife and I found out about it the first time in 2007. Uh, we were lucky enough to get a picture of it in 2014. Uh, so we had a, a tough time finding it. The other picture on the right is one I shot in my backyard back home in Michigan. It's a uh, European starling and a juvenile uh, eating uh, mealy worms. Uh, believe it or not, the bird on the right, the dark one is the, is the adult, the one on the left is the juvenile. So moving on, how about gear? Well, one of the uh, interesting thing is people don't oftentimes think about uh, their um, camera strap. A lot of people uh, will use the camera strap that came with their, uh, their equipment and will, uh, if they've got any kind of heavy lens or heavy camera, will uh, develop uh, some soreness in the back of their neck. It will get kind of tiring. Uh, and oftentimes it's not the best way to carry a camera. So it's an excellent idea to get a sturdy uh, uh, camera strap. I use a cross breast uh, chest camera strap uh, that's designed to uh, hold the camera in a, a position that's easy to view from, uh, to pick up and use. Uh, other things are, uh, for example, we talked about memory cards before. Depending on the situation you're dealing with, for example, in bird photography, uh, oftentimes you're faced with using relatively long or large lenses, which tend to be a bit heavy. Uh, in landscape photography, on the other hand, you may use very wide angle lenses or short lenses a lot, a lot lighter. So what you have to understand is the photography you're going to do, excuse me, I did not mean to do that. Um, what you're going to have to learn to figure out is what kind of equipment is going to meet your needs best. Uh, as you start out as a new photographer, you basically start out with a, with a simple camera or a DSLR and, and what we call kit lenses. And then as you, let's say, migrate into deeper into a type of photography, you uh, may have to change your strap, your lenses, your camera body. So it's something, but you need time to discover what really is your passion. Another thing is, is uh, when you go out shooting, for example, uh, I had shot at uh, Desert Museum, the, the um, uh, Avian Adventure, and I always take uh, an extra memory card and extra batteries with me. Matter of fact, my camera 
uh, I have a battery pack on it. It allows me to use two batteries. So uh, extra batteries is, is a good thing. Things you may not think about. For example, when, uh, when I go out to something I paid money to go to or something, I want to make sure that my equipment is ready. I have plenty of batteries and plenty of uh, memory cards or, to use. So another thing uh, that's important is a lot of times you just have one battery, okay? And uh, you use it till it's discharged. Uh, and you'll come up with a situation where your battery is about to go dead. I never go anyway without at least one extra battery. Uh, one thing we uh, uh, talked about last week was um, uh, just storing your pictures on a memory card. If you fill the card, you just take it out and put it somewhere. Uh, if you wanna keep any pictures for an extended period of time, it's not the best action, no matter whether you're shooting birds, landscapes, grandkids, pets, uh, whatever, okay? So it's probably a good idea to get away from uh, storing on memory cards, okay? Uh, two things to remember sorry. again. Could you say that again? Oh, sorry. I, couldn't hear sorry. At, uh, I have my uh, iPad on reviewing my lecture notes as I'm going on and it, it uh, is responding to me, which makes me crazy. By the way, this is a battery pack on a, a sample camera. And also, this is what's called the card reader. <laughs> most of you probably use SD cards. So most, uh, a lot of computers, new computers you buy have standard, standard SD cards, but not all of them do. Okay, so basically, that's your gear. Now, another thing you need to consider, all right, is... Um, Mike? Yes. Um, what, what exactly is a card reader? Oh, I'm sorry, your, your card, your memory card um, is what holds your pictures. This, I, I, okay? I know what a memory card is, but what is a card reader? Well, uh, how do you, do you, do you take pictures on a memory card? Yes. How do you get them on your computer? I just slide them into the computer. There's a slot for it. Okay, that slot is a reader. Do you understand? Okay, but the, the thing that you just had a picture of looks like a an independent piece. Is that something yes. you store yes. pictures on and then reuse your card if you're- No, no, no. The thing is, no. The thing is, is most computers are built in with a um, SD card reader. Some uh, individuals may use two different sizes of cards. Uh, all the computers just read SDs, okay? So if you have what's called a compact flash card, you need a different card reader. The difference is most are built into the computer because most people use uh, SD cards. But if you don't use SD cards, you have to have a separate reader. If you use SD cards, no problem. Don't need it at all, okay? Okay. It's nothing... Nothing special other than it's able to read the pictures, the content off the memory card and transfer it to your computer. Good question, though. Thank you. Any other questions on that? Okay. All right. When we talk about, uh, for example, specifically with uh, bird photography, if you're going to go out like a trip or something, uh, people go to Costa Rica, or you're going to go to Madeira Canyon, or you're going down to Patagonia to Patton's, or you're going to go uh, to Fort Huachuca uh, to see the birds over there. Uh, oftentimes, if you're just learning or getting into uh, the hobby, uh, you may want to try out a longer lens, a certain type of lens that you think about purchasing. Uh, you can rent them or possibly borrow them, okay? But oftentimes it's a good idea to use, uh, use the lens or whatever uh, prior to purchasing it. If you're looking at bird photography, you're talking about long lenses, usually. You're talking about landscape, you're talking about wide angle lenses and there's multiple sizes there. So uh, other photography, sports photography, you might be looking at the type of lenses you might use in bird photography. So getting a rough idea what, what is going to do the job, uh, the best way to do it is either rent or borrow one to see if it works for you, okay? 
uh, for example, um, the hummingbird picture here uh, was taken at um, uh, the Desert Museum walk, uh, Hummingbird Aviary. Okay, so the type of equipment you need, let's say in a hummingbird aviary might be a uh, short zoom, something like 200 millimeters or less. But you wanna have it, uh, what we call a very bright lens, you need a better F, pardon? Somebody say something? Oh, I'm sorry, somebody said something. But you need a bright lens, something with a lower F stop. So what, what you run into is different situations or different uh, specialties require different types of lenses. All right, types of lenses, again, these pretty much are examples of uh, the longer lenses. Uh, one there, the one on the left is a 400 millimeter, we call a prime lens. That's all it is. The one on the right is a uh, 200, 600, I believe. That is a, uh, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, I'm talking about right. It's a 600 mil which is uh, a prime lens. The interesting, the cost differential between this versus this is absolutely phenomenal, okay? Uh, this you can pick up for probably $1,000, uh, something that's around an F4, a 600 mil might be $13,000. So what you're looking at is, is different lenses, different equipment has different purchases, okay? As far as cost goes. Um, let's see where we go. Uh, yeah, as far as specifics on that, you can, you know, get with somebody later. Right now, just a general idea, bird photography, longer lenses, landscape photography, and let's say uh, with the grandkids and the pets possibly, maybe wide angles. So that's something to, to think about in the future. Another thing you might want to think about, too, is we talked about different kinds of cameras, uh, what we call full frame, which is the equivalent of the old 35 millimeter camera, and what we call an APS-C uh, camera, which is uh, smaller. Uh, those two factors become important. For example, if you're gonna do landscape, you may lean towards a uh, camera that has a full frame uh, sensor. Uh, if you're doing uh, in bird photography, sometimes people like to go with APS-C, and that can be talked about some other time. So again, uh, you've got some decisions to make once you get out of uh, just trying things out. Some of you may be established photographers and already have your passion. Uh, other people may be looking for um, uh, looking for other methods of uh, uh, specialties they'd like to get into. A uh, couple of things here, uh, as far as uh, other gear, uh, when we talk about the heavy lenses necessary with bird photography, we're gonna talk about the need for a tripod and a head for the tripod. Interesting thing, when you buy a tripod, if you buy you know uh, cheaper ones or whatever, they usually come with a head. When you get into the more expensive uh, tripods, uh, they tend to be uh, sell the tripod and the head separately. Uh, for example, with uh, landscape photography, you would probably use something uh, called a um, ball head, uh, which allows you to set up and get different angles on your landscape. But when you're doing bird photography, what you're looking for is something that will allow you to pan with the bird. Also, uh, the camera tends to be quite heavy with a long lens on it. So then you're going to look like uh, for something called a gimbal head, something that allows you to uh, track your birds and so on and so forth when they're in flight. And also another thing on, on tripods, uh, one thing you do not want to do is skimp on tripods. For example, a good tripod will last you years and years. Uh, also, remember that is the base, the stability of your equipment. If you buy a cheap tripod or a cheap head, uh, they can fail and you could have $10,000 worth of equipment sitting on your tripod 
and it's now on the ground. And trust me, it's not cheap to get your equipment repaired. So oftentimes people are gonna be penny wise and pound foolish. They'll buy a cheap tripod and think it's gonna get the job done. The, the idea is to, to learn what you really wanna do, decide what's gonna do it the best way and what is feasible for you economically to put into use, okay? So buying uh, two or three cheap tripods is probably not the best route to go. Okay, uh, and again, the lighter lighter lenses, such as uh, widening lenses, would be uh, for a ball head. That's more like you would see in landscape photography. Also, we talked about this in the first lecture. Know your camera, okay? Know how to adjust your aperture, adjust exposure uh, compensation. That's extremely important. For example, to give you an example, my wife and I were at... Uh, there's a museum yesterday and she was shooting her camera and I was shooting mine. She shoots an auto and we were shooting out in the open and the auto was using a uh, relatively slow shutter speed, 250, 1250 at the 1 350 of a second. Well, she's trying to photograph a bird in flight. That's not gonna work. Also, the auto didn't allow the camera to compensate for backlighting. So what happens is she had images that appeared rather dark. Uh, we looked at them this morning in, in uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Lightroom, and uh, I was able to brighten them up using Lightroom. So um, knowing the limitations of your equipment, well, what they can and cannot do. Uh, also, ISO is important. We talked about that. That's sensitivity, your shutter speed. If you're doing anything involving moving subjects at all, okay, and some birds move constantly, you need to be very cognizant of your shutter speed. And uh, uh, changing uh, your metering mode. For example, uh, when we were shooting a single bird yesterday, uh, the best metering mode would have been spot mode directly on the bird rather than reading all the background. Uh, the blue sky, okay? Uh, and importantly, uh, good photography and good images are some, some are the camera, but most of it, it's, uh, it's you. It's not the gear, it's what you do. And learning from your previous mistakes and continue to uh, practice is the key, okay? If all you're looking to do is snapshots, you know, the grandkids and the dog and stuff, that's cool. You can probably get away with your uh, phone. But if you really want to uh, grow in a, a content area, landscapes, uh, bird photography and such, you got to practice. And that, when you don't work anymore, a lot of time, you have to find something to occupy you. And that's what I discovered. I discovered photography and bird photography to help me focus my time. All right, shutter speed. We talked about this before. This is the same diagram you've seen before. Generally, when we're talking like, for example, you use an example here, birds in flight, you probably want to be at least one two thousandth of a second. When I was shooting yesterday, I usually was at one four thousandth of a second. And uh, in the case of <clears throat> shutter speed, especially, especially on a bright sunny day, uh, you don't really have to worry too much about ISO or um, your aperture, okay? So uh, shutter speed is extremely important. If you're taking care of landscape, shutter speed is not important at all uh, because your mountains or your valley or your uh, not, excuse me, flowers do move in the wind are not going to be affected necessarily by, they're not going to move. So uh, what you've got to do is get a good understanding of when it's important. And the important thing after you shoot pictures is to look at the results. And what do you see? If you see a uh, uh, blur in your images, okay, it can be due to camera shake. It can be due to movement of the subject. Okay, what you have to do is realize, okay, the shutter speed I used was inadequate to deal with that. And you cannot look at the images alone without looking at the metadata and really make a conscious decision of what you could have done to make the picture better. 
Any questions so far? Am I talking too fast? Good. All right. How about ISO and shutter speed? We talked about those with the uh, <clears throat> the um, exposure triangle. Okay. Uh, so that becomes important depending on the type of thing you're shooting. What your subject is. Is it a group? Is it birds? Is it buffalo? Is it mountains? Is it dogs? Whatever. So uh, know your exposure triangle and know how to put it into good use, okay? Um, this uh, gives you an example. For example, this camera is set at auto ISO. That's what I use on my camera, auto ISO and manual, okay? But it also gives you a range to say, do not go lower than 100 or higher than 3200, okay? And um, it will let you adjust, adjust minimum shutter speed. So what this does basically is allow you to set the parameters that you find acceptable, you know, for noise, uh, for uh, over or under exposure, all right? Fast frame rates, uh, min minimally, I, I recommend, I suggest, even shooting static images, I shoot approximately three to five frames a second in a burst mode, okay? Uh, three is probably adequate. I use five as an example, but I personally never shoot single shot, okay? Uh, it doesn't meet my needs and it doesn't allow me to compensate, let's say, for a camera shape. When you shoot single shot, every time you take a picture, you have to push the shutter button. One problem with that is every time you push the shutter button, there is a tendency of developing what's called camera shape. So if you shoot 35 images uh, with one uh, push of the shutter, you're going to eliminate that possibility of camera shape. But that, that is personal preference. Uh, uh, my camera has the capability of shooting at 20 to 30 frames a second. I rarely, if ever, do that. I don't think I will ever use 30 frames a second. So what you've got, in, my purpose in three to five is to eliminate every possibility, if at all, of camera shape. I also tend to shoot at relatively high uh, shutter speeds, okay? We saw this diagram on Monday, uh, not on Monday, but uh, two weeks ago. And I, again, this is an example. This is the, um, uh, the Avian Adventure, same bird last year. And uh, the interesting thing about this uh, is it shows you how much action takes place inside of one second. This is how many frames occurred, excuse me, in one second's time, okay? And why is that important? All right, for example, if you're shooting at a relatively low shutter speed, okay, um, you're not going to catch this. If you look at the different wing positions, okay, and positions in the photo, here's one, two, and each of these occurred in one tenth of a second, three, four, and interesting, look at the uh, visitors or people viewing this on the side. Their position has not changed at all. And look at all the changes the bird has made in that brief one second time. So when we're dealing with subjects that are moving rapidly, uh, for, uh, for interest, we like to see different bird wing positions possibly. We like to see different activities. So what ha happens, <clears throat> excuse me, in that one second time, <clears throat> you have 10 different shots. You have 10 different presentations of your subject. So you can pick one you think is best, okay? <clears throat> priority modes, we've talked about before. Uh, shutter proper priority is probably uh, my last choice, all right? Uh, aperture priority, if you're going to use one of the priority settings, is probably the best, okay? Um, 
you are able to control the shutter speed in, in aperture priority by, if you want it fast, using the lowest f-stop, okay? Uh, they refer to that oftentimes as wide open, okay? So wide open will make sure the camera gets as much light in as possible, allowing faster shutter speeds, okay? Manual mode, again, uh, that's something you need to make a choice on yourself. Uh, in the past, manual mode was pure manual. You set your aperture, your shutter speed, plus you set your ISO. Now, in this day and age, you have the ability to do ISO auto. So you can set your shutter speed and your uh, aperture, and the ISO will, will adjust to the point where you're going to have uh, a proper exposure. Okay, autofocus. Uh, for example, a lot of the little birdies I shoot are very small, uh, possibly two to three inches, some even smaller. So when you're trying to focus on that, it's probably not a good idea to use all of your focus points. You probably want to use a center focus, spot focus, it's called. And uh, you want to aim at the bird's eye, okay? That's always the rule, aim at the bird's eye, okay? When it comes to, for example, like a landscape, you don't have an eye to aim at. Well, one thing you have to understand is you want to get as much of the image in focus as possible, okay? So you've got to know the, uh, the depth of field that is available on the lens you use and how to best focus for that. And that would come with uh, doing a little more research on landscape photography. When you're doing birds in flight, and we want a dy dynamic focus mode. Uh, oftentimes, um, my camera calls it bird uh, tracking. So we track the image and what locks on and it stays locked on. So when the bird is coming at you, flying at you, it will continue to focus. When it, uh, if you did not have that mode, you would have to adjust focus uh, throughout the process. Okay, uh, sensitivity of focus, uh, I use locked on oftentimes. You can make it extremely sensitive, which would be locked on, or you can make it, uh, excuse me, I mean, uh, extremely sensitive would be, uh, it will respond to different images. If you wanna lock on an image, you're going to uh, decrease sensitivity, that when you grab at a subject, you wanna stay on that subject. And the camera should always be set to continuous, continuous autofocus. Uh, you have, uh, some of you may be using your uh, primary, primary uh, focus mode as single shot, okay? Um, as far as uh, the rationale behind the single shot versus uh, a continuous focus, uh, my tendency is to lead uh, towards uh, continuous focus. All right. So under that circumstance, I'm ready for anything. If I'm going to need to shoot rapid shots, I don't have to screw around with changing my uh, focus from, let's say, single shot to continuous. Uh, camera shape, it's associated oftentimes with the up and down motion associated with releasing the shutter. Uh, oftentimes, uh, your camera has uh, different modes of uh, uh, they don't refer to it as camera shake, they refer to it as vibration. So the most common vibration you're going to get when you squeeze the shutter is an up and down motion, okay? So uh, generally you would set your, your vibration mode on one. Let's say you're shooting birds and you're panning, all right? You need to have a, a uh, vibration compensation that deals not only with up and down, but right and left. So it's important to know also uh, that when you have uh, tools to prevent camera shake, uh, for example, when you start using extremely high shutter speeds, uh, your lens itself can cause alteration in the quality of the image. Uh, basically, it means if you have high shutter speeds, you generally don't have to use the vibration compensation. 
I, yeah, that's my personal opinion. I could be wrong, but that's something you'll have to find out on your own. How do you create images of birds? Uh, birds are any animals, uh, any wildlife, uh, and also grandkids. Uh, approach slow, slowly, excuse me. Or if you're doing street photography, uh, you want to approach the subject slowly, okay, and uh, in a comfortable, open manner. <clears throat> okay, so with birds, they get kind of jumpy sometimes. So it's a good idea to approach them slowly and know what birds are more, uh, let's say, relaxed with humans and others. For example, when you go out to Reed Park or you go to Kennedy uh, Park uh, or you go out to Desert Museum, oftentimes the birds you see out in the open there are used to human beings. So they don't scare away, especially like ducks. They, uh, they're always looking for a handout. So it's a good idea to know the environment you in, you're in and what kind of uh, uh, reception you may get from your subject, whether it be human or animal. Another thing, when you're uh, doing pictures uh, overseas in other countries, it's extremely important to know the customs. For example, I was stationed in Turkey and the elderly uh, people uh, Turkish people uh, felt, and this was their belief, that when you took a picture, you captured their soul. And that's not a joke, okay? So when you're dealing with people, not everybody, remember, are Americans. So you need to be aware of what uh, customs are relative to photography. And always, if you're going to ask to take somebody's picture, offer to supply a copy to, of them sometime. Get an email address or something like that. If you access, have access to a printer, print a copy up, okay? And always ask permission, okay? So uh, when you're dealing with uh, not only humans, but birds, you wanna separate the bird from the background, okay? And this is done with depth of field and your uh, F-stop. Uh, again, focus on the bird's eye. Uh, I'm I luckily have a camera now that will focus, focus directly on the bird's eye. So that helps me out a uh, whole hell of a lot, okay? Know what's happening around you, okay? Uh, you could be focused on something and you got a whole group of birds flying over or you've got somebody uh, 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 approaching you from behind, you know? So, You've got you've to be able to be aware of what is happening around you, okay? Uh, try and make your images, uh, your composition interesting. Uh, for example, uh, with birds, a lot of times you have branches and foliage around. Uh, so oftentimes it clutters up your image. Uh, let's say you're taking a picture of, uh, of a friend or something like, uh, and they have a tree trunk growing out of their head, it looks like. Or so you have to take into consideration when you look at people to shoot pictures, you've got to look at everything in the image to make sure there's nothing there to distract the viewer of the image from the image itself. Look for great light, if possible, stay away from your subject staring directly into the sun. Um, mostly with humans, uh, I'm sure it's that way with some pets. So look for great light. Often the best light is in early morning or late afternoon or early evening. Uh, also, if you have, have a favorite spot, all right, go to it frequently, check it out, see what's going on there, okay? Also, when dealing with subjects, that are alive, humans, pets, wildlife, birds, know what their behavior is. For example, hummingbirds oftentimes will fly out, grab a bug or something from the air and then fly back to the same, exact same branch. There's another type of bird called a flycatcher, which flies out from a perch and returns back to that exact same perch. So you've got a situation where you know your subject is going to return to the same spot. <clears throat> what you do is you set your camera, focus on that spot, get it all prepped. So when the, the bird or animal comes back to that spot, 
you take a picture, you're all set. You don't have to screw around with focus or anything else. So capture behavior, know what the behavior is. Be creative, uh, shoot from a different angle. You know, don't shoot the standard, you know, everybody does it type thing. That's great if you're on a show that you've been somewhere like the Hoover Dam or something, you want to post it on Facebook, but get creative. If you're trying to, you know, create something that piques interest, try doing something just a little bit different. Uh, birds, again, are kind of skittish and so are animals, okay? Uh, coyotes, foxes, uh, bobcats, I'm sure, uh, can be very skittish. So again, you need to approach them slowly, okay? For example, when wanting to take a shot of, let's say, a raptor up in a very tall tree, a dead tree called a snag, uh, what I do is I'll take a shot when I uh, visualize it first, I see it, I'll take a shot, take a few shots, move a little closer, take a few more shots, move a little closer, take a few more shots. You want to get to the point where uh, you make sure you get a shot of the bird, but uh, you don't want to wait. And I just want to take the best shot, so I'm not going to take those others. It just makes sense to take a shot, uh, take a safe shot. You're eventually going to hit the po part or point where the bird is going to take off or the critter is all right so what you want is you also want to be prepared for what excuse me when that animal takes off on you a bird you can catch it in flight hopefully you can get the animal before they dump jump into the brush all right behavior no behavior of any of your subjects birds grandkids no that baby's favorite toy if you're taking pictures of babies Dogs, what's their favorite toy? Same thing with, uh, I put, I have bird feeders out in my uh, patio here. Uh, I use those to occasionally take pictures of birds around the area. So uh, know the behaviors, know what they like to eat, know what they don't like to eat. Learn as much as you can about your subject. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to create better picture, pictures when you know your subjects. Learn where the birds nest, learn where they feed. Same thing, where did the animal create their den, okay? What does the kid like to play with most at the park? Mating habits. Uh, oftentimes with birds, the most colorful they are is uh, <clears throat> in the mating season. Season, excuse me. Uh, the males oftentimes will develop some absolutely magnificent colors. So, and know when mating season is. They tend to be more protective during mating season also. For example, here's a gray hawk, okay? Uh, they nest in higher trees and you see them uh, down around uh, in Southern Arizona. They're usually found in Mexico, by the way. But in Southern Arizona, you'll find them down in Tubac, uh, <clears throat> Patagonia area, usually a little bit further south than uh, in Green Valley. I, Maybe some people have seen a gray, uh, gray hawk in Green Valley, but I'm not really aware of it. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And you'll rarely see it up in Tucson. So again, you need to know uh, where they like to live, you know, and uh, where they feed and nest. Now, behavior, I mentioned fly catchers a minute ago, what their feeding behavior is. This is a vermilion fly catcher, okay? Uh, it was probably the, sitting on that branch a second ago. So what it's doing, it's flying out, gets a bug, and comes back and sets right on that branch again, okay? So as long as you don't violate its space or get too close, they'll continue to do that. And it's predictable behavior. When you see a vermilion flycatcher, which is very bright and red, easy to identify, you can know it's going to fly out grab a bug and come back, okay? So isolate your birds from the background, okay? Again, uh, try to avoid perching, uh, uh, taking pictures of them purchasing, perching, God, I'm having a hell of a day here, excuse me, perching in thick branches or deep grass. It doesn't make for a good picture, okay? Songbirds will flit from branch to branch and tree to tree. Uh, for example, uh, there's a little warbler called an orange crown warbler, uh, which flits around like crazy. It's a very 
a lot of very tiny little birds that are all over, all over the place. And when you first get into bird photography, trying to take a picture of one, a good picture, a clean picture, is extremely difficult, okay? And uh, if possible, with a bird, for example, in branches, uh, or having some close foliage behind them, a good idea is to shoot a wide aperture. For example, at, uh, at uh, the <clears throat> Avian Experience, I was shooting in uh, at about F2.8 on my 7200 lens to um, blur out the background, okay? Um, again, a lot of times you don't have that luxury, okay? Um, so trying to find a clean background may be better than trying to use a, uh, a focal, excuse me, a aperture you don't necessarily have. Busy blurred backgrounds, okay? Uh, there is a way if I was shooting like in an F28 or a 1.4, depending, I, that fence would become a blur. Right now, that's not a very good picture. If all, the only purpose in taking the picture of the bird is to say, I've identified the bird, I have seen this bird, that's okay. But as far as sharing with others or anything like it, it's not really that interesting. Here's an example of a flycatcher uh, that is flying off from a branch, but look, the background is all out of focus. The bokeh is very good, okay? The bokeh means the, uh, the background. So if possible, blur the background. You want the focus of the picture to be the bird, not the background. Bird position, for example, this is one I shot last year. Um, uh, I can't remember which park it was, uh, over on uh, the nor northwest side of Tucson. And if you look, the branch is going right through the eye. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's a Cooper's hawk or a immature red tail. Uh, I'm kind of shaky on some of my uh, definitions. Okay, excuse me, my uh, identification. Let me get back here because it missed the other one. All right, so let's get, all right, there we go. If you notice here, what did I do? All I did was move to the left a couple of steps. Same bird, same basic position. What did I do? I just changed my position. Sometimes you can't do everything with a lens, uh, a zoom, so to speak. Oftentimes you have to do it with your feet. So look at a bird position. And if it's not the one you want, change the position. Again, God, focusing on the bird's eye must, must be kind of important, all right? Focused eye is the key to creating stunning photographs of birds. Because what happens is our eye, when we look at a picture or an image, uh, focuses directly at the bird's eye, okay? It draws the viewer into the picture. And uh, it's a good idea to shoot with the sun behind you, all right? Uh, you don't want the bird backlit unless it's absolutely necessary. This is a... Um, uh, it's not a pipe. I think it's a uh, eared grebe. Okay, and notice the beautiful orange eye. Okay, so immediately when you look at the picture, you zoom right there. And generally, if you have the eye in focus, you have the rest of the bird in focus. Know what's going on around you. Prepare for the unexpected. Keep both eyes opus open when focusing. I have to be honest, I have never been able to uh, perfect that method. I always closed my left eye uh, and I've been shooting for God, what, 52 years. So yeah, I just haven't got to the point where I can close. I keep both eyes open. It's a good thing, but I just can't seem to do it yet. Listen for noises indicating something is happening. Uh, birds make sounds. Uh, not always chirping, but chirping is there. Like for hummingbirds, I listen for the wings, the sound of the wings, okay? Uh, so listen for noises. Noise, as a matter of fact, you can identify a bird legitimately just by IDing their call. And uh, occasionally it's a good idea to take your eye off the viewfinder. But I always think sometimes I take my eye off the view, viewfinder and just lost the best picture I could ever shot, but that's just me. I'm kind of uh, paranoid about that kind of stuff. Any questions? Anybody still awake?
Okay. Y'all could be gone and I wouldn't know. All right. How about try to take bird pictures from their perspective? Uh, good idea, like when shooting ducks, uh, get down on ground level or the level of the pond or the lake. All right. Uh, <clears throat> with birds, try to get on their level. If they're in a low, uh, low bush, a good idea to um, get down on your knee. My problem, I get down on my knee. Uh, I need somebody to help me up. Keep your lens at eye level. Okay, so it's, it's, you're not moving uh, the lens up and down. You wanna see if you can keep that lens at eye level. Uh, also, uh, these positions allow for a blurred background depending on your f-stop. Also, if you get down, let's say on the ground level with ducks or something, it will take some of the background out of the image. And also give the bird room in the frame, especially if the bird appears to be moving one direction or the other. If you uh, have an image where the bird's bill is just uh, about up to the end of the frame, uh, it gives an uncomfortable feeling to the person viewing it uh, that the bird's got nowhere to go. So give the bird or give the coyote, the fox, the grandkid, uh, the player, baseball player, give them room in the frame, okay? That means you have to leave your um, viewing area a little bit larger than what you may want. Also, uh, it's important to realize uh, you can crop images on post-processing, but uh, it's uh, very difficult to add more space to a photo uh, or um, move or uh, repair a wing that appears to be out of the image. So a good idea is give room in the frame, but this comes with time and experience. For example, it's a road runner, okay? And he's got room to run. And I picked a picture where both his feet are almost off the ground. This one is on the, the tip of his uh, talon. This one, just a back foot, okay? And he looks like he's moving, okay? So, but he has room to move into uh, or out of the frame, okay? Again, it comes with practice and training. Create interesting composition. This is a picture of a male ruddy duck. It was shot out at Sweetwater, okay? Uh, probably a couple of years ago. Okay, the beauty of this duck is the, the, the uh, sky blue bill, okay, the rusty color on the, uh, the back and wings, okay, the white uh, neck here, okay, and the eye. Uh, notice I took it <clears throat> in what would appear to be a busy background, okay, and it is, but uh, it demonstrates the environment this duck lives in and also hides in. Also, the fact that we have a relatively adequate reflection also makes it a somewhat interesting picture. Look for bright light. Again, best light early in the mornings and late in the day. That applies both for um, sunsets, sunrises. Uh, also, birds tend to be more active uh, at these times, uh, generally in the morning, excuse me, let me get back to that. Let's get back here again. Let's see here. What did I lock up here? I'm gonna stop sharing for a second and bring it back on. Okay, any questions at this point at all? And I appreciate you hanging in with me, okay. Uh, oh, Mike, how do, you, yeah. um, how do you set your camera so that you blur the background? I can well, never get that right. Well, the, the key is actually, the key is your F-stop, okay? Um, 
for example, most kit lenses don't have, when you're talking about, depending on the type of lens, for example, when you're talking telephoto lenses, uh, like um, uh, the lens I used yesterday was a 70 to 200, and the widest opening uh, or the most light is allowed in by uh, f2.8, okay? So, uh, but your longer telephoto lenses, uh, generally, if you can get one f4. So what happens is the, um, there are three factors, as I think I mentioned last week, that affect depth of field. One is the f-stop, two is your distance from the subject, and three is your focal length. The longer the focal length, uh, the more difficult it is to blur your background. So can you example of, uh, give me an example of what lens you're using and what type of situation it is? Well, I just have a bridge camera and okay. I, I apologize. I missed your class last week. I'm trying to catch that up, but it hasn't appeared on YouTube yet. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we didn't record it last week. Oh, uh, I, can, I can send you a copy of uh, if you'll send me an email, okay, uh, it's uh, Mike, M-I-K-E, four, F-O-R-E, at Comcast.net. Send me an email. Tell me you want last week's lecture. I'll send you the entire PowerPoint, okay? Okay. So at least you'll have that as a reference. And by the way, uh, as I told you the first session, and I'll tell you again, and I mean it honestly, okay? You can email me about any subject relative to cameras or photography. You can text me at 810-516-0220. You can text me or call me if you need be about questions about photography or camera. If you're inter interested in meeting one-on-one, -on -one, for example, to pond or something like that, or you want to meet as a group, two or three or four of you, I'm more than willing to do that. Okay, because uh, a lot of times it's better one on one or in a small group than it is on Zoom. So uh, I would generally want to do the best possible for you. And sometimes that requires you and I to meet in person. I am fully vaccinated and boosted and I do wear a mask. So um, does that answer your question? Uh, was it Marilyn who asked about uh, last week's lecture? Yes, it was Marilyn. Okay, Marilyn, thank you. Does that answer your question? I will get that out to you as soon as you send me an email. Okay, so what I, if I want to blur the background, mm -hmm. then am I using a small f-stop or a large number? Small f-stop. A small f-stop. Yeah, yeah, well, like blur. anything okay. below f4. Go ahead, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yes. Do you, now, do you have a hint on how to remember that? Because I have the hardest time remembering that. Actually, uh, um, I'll tell you what. Um, if you want to think about depth of field, think about f-stops instead of thinking about letting light in. Think about uh, depth of field. And if you want uh, the best depth of field, let's see, how are we talking about this? The best depth of field. The best depth of field would be like F22. If you want a shallow depth of field, your lowest F number. Okay? A shallow depth of field, blur out the background, is your lowest F stop. Okay. Okay? There's a problem with, with thinking the light and F numbers, they're, they're counterintuitive. You know, you think F1, 4, let's say, wouldn't let much light in, but in reality, they let the most in. So what I suggest you do instead of looking at, at as the amount of light you're letting in, think about is blurring the background, least depth of field. So okay. lowest F-stop number, shallowest depth of field, blur the background. Okay. That may help. Thank you. Oh, okay, good. All right. Any other questions? Thank yeah, my question now. Mike, yes. Randy, hi. Say, hi. Mike, uh, talk a little bit about when you take a picture, like behind you, all those birds are flying. When you try to crop them down, when you're trying to get a final picture, 
<clears throat> I was at Whitewater Draw last week, you know, and I got a picture like behind you with all the cranes. Uh -huh. But then when I tried to isolate maybe three good cranes in there, when you try to crop too much, you lose clarity. You know, yeah, really part of the problem, if I can anticipate the rest of the question, part of the problem is uh, if you take a group like this, you're not going to be able to isolate. Okay, the the purpose of a picture like that is to show how they come in in flocks. If you want to, for example, uh, <clears throat> get like narrow it down, zero it down, take images as their first landing or capture isolated birds, or if you can catch them in flight, that may be difficult, but try to focus on isolated birds, okay? Because uh, this a group like this, and, nah, it's not gonna happen. You got too much there, too much clutter there. You know, yeah. it serves the purpose, okay? But as far as isolating a bird net, and uh, you're gonna have to one, crop too tight. Uh, the image quality is going to decrease. And it's very often very difficult to isolate you know, a couple of birds. So my yeah. suggestion would try to find a couple of birds isolated. Okay? Yeah. All right. Any other questions? If not, I will get rock and roll again if I can pick up where the hell I was. All right. Okay. Okay. Where was we? I think, yeah, we stopped here. Was it this? No, we did that already. Trying to catch up to where we were here. Yeah, okay. Okay, looking for great light again, early in the morning, late in the day. Uh, they're called the golden hours oftentimes. Uh, <clears throat> and also a nice thing about early in the morning is uh, birds, birds tend to be uh, much more active at time, that time. Although in Arizona, uh, when it gets real cold in the morning, uh, they don't get active till let's say uh, possibly 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. So um, uh, they kind of sleep in because it's cold outside, all right? Uh, visit a location frequently. For example, uh, going to Madeira Canyon, uh, you go there and you're, you're comfortable with what you see on the, let's say, uh, Proctor Trail. You know what kind of birds you're going to see at, uh, at for example, Santa Rita Lodge on the feeders. You know, you're guaranteed to see acorn woodpeckers. You're guaranteed to see Mexican jays. Uh, you're guaranteed to see a few hummingbirds. Usually, uh, you'll see uh, a broadbill hummingbird. You might see the Rivoli or the uh, magnificent hummingbird. But uh, if you get get familiar with different locales, okay? You find out what you're gonna see and when you're gonna see it. For example, uh, uh, the birds are not as prolific right now at Santa Rita Lodge, but that will pick up as soon as we get into mid-February to later. So what happens, you, uh, you'll you get a feel for what you're probably gonna see, okay? So <clears throat> know the good vantage points for photos, and best lighting conditions, okay? For example, uh, that picture I showed at the beginning of uh, the um, <clears throat> uh, elegant trogan, that was shot at the pyrocanthus bush that is located along the road up to the top uh, just before, uh, God, is it um, the, I can't remember, it's Madeira camping area or White House camping. It, it, it's right across from the restroom uh, on the uh, opposite side of the road. Uh, but that pyrocanthus bush, that bird was there every morning between about 8, 8, 8.30 and 10.30, okay? Guaranteed just about, okay? So there'd be a group of us and you'd drive by and see a ton of people all set up with their tripods right on the edge of the road to take pictures of the elegant trogan. So you find out what the habits, what the birds do, where they're going to be, okay? And it makes it much more interesting and more fun. For example, this is the uh, Canoe Ranch Pond, and uh, I frequent that place, okay? Because um, I know I'm going to see some birds, usually ducks. Pickens have been kind of thin, uh, like in December, 
in earlier January, but pickings are uh, stepping up. You're going to start to see smaller birds coming out uh, probably uh, again uh, in February and as we get closer to spring. So visit a location frequently. Get comfortable with it. Capture a bird's behavior, okay? Uh, this, by the way, is a barn owl, and that was at, at uh, Raptor Free Flight uh, in, uh, at Desert Museum. This one is a gray hawk again. And uh, for example, uh, these birds fly free, okay? Uh, they are not tethered at all. So uh, after you get to the point where you just want to get a nice picture of an owl sitting there, you okay, and you want to start grabbing pictures with uh, <clears throat> that are tack sharp and uh, are interesting. So this is a bird, the barn owl taking off. Uh, the wings are a little soft and these are a little soft. Uh, that possibly could be from the shutter speed. But you look at this one, it's pretty much tack sharp. So you know where the birds are going to be if possible you can get the best shot possible of them. Get creative, experiment, okay? Uh, <clears throat> the, the people who, you know, well, I've been doing this way for 40 years and I'm gonna continue, well, that's fine, okay? But uh, I never hesitate to try something new. If it works and I can make it work, I'm gonna do it, okay? If it doesn't, I'm not, very simple but I'm always learning. I've learned possibly something that doesn't work for me. But if I find a new technique that works, I'm gonna use it, okay? Uh, mess with shutter speeds, different angles, okay? Um, try shooting up at a bird possibly, or try shooting down, depending on the situation. Get creative, try something unique. Silhouettes are, you think they'd be awfully easy, they're not, okay? Here's one, for example, this is a Phenopepla. I shot this at um, Tumacockery uh, Mission. There's a little uh, water feature and a little patio area there. Uh, I liked it because the bird is tack sharp and this is out of focus and this behind the bird is out of focus. Okay, so I obviously shot at a very low f-stop. I couldn't tell you at the moment what it was, but it's an interesting shot because you still, at least to me, not everybody like it, some people do, but you've got the bird's eye, okay? You've got the very, you know, very detailed, uh, um, oh, God, what's the word I'm thinking of? Comb, for want of a better word, on top of their head, the detail on the bird itself. So uh, another thing is isolating parts of the bird, okay? Uh, sometimes you can isolate just on the head or just on the talons, or just, let's say, on a wing. So try things, see what works. Because the whole joy of, of picking up a hobby like this, I don't care whether it's birds or anything else, is to grow with it, is to learn from it, is to broaden your, for it's kind of trite, I guess, but broaden your high horizons, okay? Also with birds, and the, this would apply also to automobiles. For example, this bird was flying, okay, and I panned with this bird. Pan means you go like this. And I usually have my shutter uh, pressed, so I'm shooting rapid fire, okay? So notice the bird is pretty much tack sharp. Look at the background, totally blurred. Probably a combination of f-stop and also the fact I was panning, okay? Uh, you can shoot lower shutter speeds, but you have to figure out what works. If you lower your shutter speed and you can't keep the bird tack sharp, you're going to have to increase your speed, okay? And when you pan, you don't want to do this kind of number. You want, you want to do a smooth pan, okay? And these are things all take practice. Same thing if you're shooting racing cars. If you stop, you can always stop a car dead at a racetrack with the background all clear and everything else, but does it give any interest to the photo? Does it look like it's moving? No, it's stopped dead. So what you wanna be able to do is follow the automobile, take pictures as you follow it. And notice the entire background will be blurred, okay? And it adds a ton of uh, interest to the image. It actually tells the story. 
but it requires practice and time, okay? The key again is to keep your subject in focus. Learn, grow, and enjoy. A great gear doesn't equal great shots. Great shots are a result of practice, planning, and proper execution. Better focus on the bird's eye or the subject results in better flight images, okay? Uh, the ultimate goal of most bird photographers is doing birds in flight. It, it'll make you crazy. Practicing on large birds improves birds in flight images. You ever go out to the pond and they're curious, watch a, uh, let's say, a great blue heron fly or a, a great egret fly, and then watch a vermilion flycatcher fly, okay? Trust me. Uh, one moves a heck of a lot slower than the other one does. So practice on birds first, large birds. Then start working with ducks, okay? Then start working with uh, smaller birds. To continue that thought, ducks, geese, cranes, herons are excellent to practice on. Also, um, your uh, bald eagle, okay? Uh, your larger raptors, okay? Uh, foriginous hawk, that type of thing, are great to practice on. It's interesting to, to go out at uh, to the Desert Museum and they fly the peregrine falcon and you're ready to pull your hair out, okay? But the uh, uh, foriginous hawk comes out or the great horned owl comes out and it's relatively easy to follow and shoot. Also, setting feeders in a, a bird bath at your home is a good idea. Um, I do it here. Uh, some people are fans, some are not. And bird photography is rewarding, addictive, and fun. Okay? It's fun, but it can also be very frustrating. And the nice thing about frustration is it's your op opportunity to learn. If you know everything or do everything only in your comfort zone, you'll never grow. Okay? A uh, tack sharp image of a bird in flight will put a smile on your face. Trust me. And I'll kind of puff up your chest a little bit. All right. So thanks for this. And I wanted to, um, oh, the picture I added didn't show. This was the one I wanted to show. And I've got a couple of things I want to show you, not in the PowerPoint. This is my wife yesterday at the, uh, uh, the Avian Adventure. Uh, that's our buddy. His name is Klaus. Uh, he's a Eurasian, Eurasian eagle owl. Uh, he's big, uh, but he's, as they say, a pussycat. It was, it was a fabulous time, out, outstanding time. So if you can bear with me a few uh, minute, minutes, uh, I've got some interesting shots I want to show you that can give you some examples of kind of what we talked about, all right? Uh, I'm going to bring up my light room here. Any questions while I'm doing this? Of course not. All right. Okay. Let's see. Let me get some up here I can uh, make it crazy with here. Let's see. Do, 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 do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take it down here. One quick thing here. You guys can't see it yet anyway, can you? Mm -mm. Okay, good. All right, here we go. All right, can you see that? Can yes. you see the screen? Yes. Okay, these are some pictures uh, I shot yesterday at the uh, uh, the Avian Adventure. Take for example, let me uh, be critical of my pictures. Okay, here's a shot. My wife had just released this bird from a wrist. Okay, anybody want to volunteer? to guess what the biggest problem with this picture is? 
the whole wing isn't in view? Well, that, that could be. The, since I was trying to relate the bird to my wife, what's happening? We don't see my <laughs> wife. Okay. So how would I correct this? I would do move back and over to the side a bit. Okay. The bird's fine. Okay. It's tax sharp. It's, you know, it's looking that way. Also, things are, you know, certain images where the bird is not, uh, you miss the wing or something. After a while, sometimes that doesn't become as important. Okay. Uh, like here, the, the wing is cut off a bit. All right. But I don't think it detracts from the image because what focus here in the image is the bird's eye. Okay. Now, here we have one where I got all the wing and everything else, but it's not really a whole lot of excitement there. Okay. Now, this one. The wings cut off, this is blurred, the tail's gone. But as far as the picture goes, does anybody like it? Yeah. I think it's beautiful. So the, the thing is, when you get to one, for example, now two years ago, I wouldn't do this because wait a minute, no, I, I, I need to get all the wings in. I need to, you know, cutting off their head is a problem, you know, no question about that. But sometimes some of the other, uh, uh, issues are not, not necessarily as important. Let's see if I find this one again. All right. Here's another one again with uh, the whole bird is in there. Okay. And here the background is blurred, about as blurred as I get, but I'm at F28. I would have hoped it would have been more blurred. Do you find what I'm saying? But remember what I told you, there's three factors involved in depth of field. The focal length, right here, I was at about 150 millimeters. The distance, this bird probably was not any more than 12 feet away, okay? And f-stop. I had the best f-stop I could. I wasn't at that large or long a focal length. But the problem was the bird was so close that I couldn't get the background blurred as much as I would like. Okay, and find a couple. Of, I don't want to run off through all these silly things. Let's see, here's on that one already. And again, the purpose in this was if I'm, I was doing a little slideshow or something on the avian adventure, this would be an acceptable image. One, because the subject in this is the bird. He's tax sharp, the birds are sharp. And we see that he's <clears throat> landing on the wing. I think he's landing. Let's see if he's landing or flying. I think he was landing. Okay. So another thing. Okay. One nice thing is uh, the light coming through the owl's wings. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I would love to have had most of these pictures not to have any subject in there but uh, not any people in it, but that wasn't an option, okay? This is uh, one of the better ones of the bird just taking off from my wife's hand, okay? And she complained, well, you can't see the bird's face. And I said, well, you know, what the hell? But uh, so, you know, basically all I'm trying to say is, uh, see, I like that. See, it captures, the moment just before the bird lands. It's got my wife, it's got the trainer, it's got, you know, you're in the desert because of the background, okay? But I like that picture, okay? To me, it tells a story. So enough of me yapping. If there's no other questions, and if you would like to set up something one-on-one -on -one, or you got any questions, or I've given your email address, my email address at least two or three times, I've given you my cell phone, okay? Um, and I do not charge. I will not accept any money for this, okay? I do it because I love it. And I do it because if somebody really wants to grow, especially in bird photography, uh, I take it as a responsibility that if I have some expertise or talent uh, uh, to share it with others. If you think I'm full of crap and my style doesn't interest you, that's okay too, not a problem. But I'm just making myself available. 
uh, to anybody who is interested uh, because I love doing this. Uh, and because every time I do something like that with somebody, I learn something. So uh, thank you for putting up with Good me. Night. Yes. I do have one question. Could you just talk really briefly about something I've read about called the rule of thirds? Oh yeah, no problem. Excellent, excellent question. Here, I'll show you. Okay. Excellent question. Okay. That, by the way, can you see the diagram over the picture? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the rule of thirds. Okay. And what the rule of thirds says, you, if at all possible, would like to have a subject, one of your, your points of interest here, 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 or here. Okay, the idea being that that is a focus point. Let me say, let me give me another image. Here we go. Here's one now. Okay, the this, by the way, is how it's cropped currently. Okay, right now we have this area on a marker, this area, this area, and this area. Okay, and I really don't want to go too tight necessarily. You know, if I wanted to go this, you do go that way, you lose everything about the image. Do you follow what I'm saying? It just, hmm. so trying to get the rule of thirds in doesn't always work, always work. You try to get them. Sometimes you can, sometimes you don't. Let me grab another one here that, uh, let's see. Okay, this one. Now, you've got, this one kind of, well, wait a minute. You don't have anything specific here, specific there. But the important thing is this, this uh, frame is filled with the image. Also, another thing in composition, we talk about the row of thirds, but we also talk about diagonals. This out of focus wing draws you right here. The talons draw you right here, okay? So what, what the rule of thirds does is help you position things in the frame so they are pleasing to the human eye. This is, this is theoretically based on the um, uh, research they've done on how people react to a uh, certain positioning of images, okay? By the way, if you look at the great artists of the past, the masters, they use the rule of thirds. Uh, for example, here, my wife again. Uh, she's here. The bird is here. Uh, her elbow is here. So it, it takes into consideration what makes the best shot. For example, if I eliminated the, uh, let's see, I eliminate the, um, okay. This, by the way, is the image before I processed it. Okay. Not a real good photo, is it? Not real interesting, okay? Uh, it's not interesting, the colors are not bright, so on and so forth. So what you have to do is not only follow the rule of thirds, by the way, you can do the rule of thirds once the, Im once the image is taken, okay? A lot of people sometimes will try and set up the rule of thirds uh, while they're framing the picture. Now that would probably be a great thing, okay? if you're shooting a mountain range or something. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to shoot, um, let's say birds in flight or something like that, uh, it's not gonna really work. Uh, my wife and I uh, have different techniques. She over crops, okay? She crops so tight in camera. One, she takes a lot of time and two, it oftentimes doesn't work out, work out because the bird changes slight position. So by the way, did I answer your question about the rule of thirds? Yes, that was really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Nope. Well, again, I hope uh, some of you take advantage of, uh, of getting with me if you think I can teach you anything. If not, uh, good luck mm -hmm. and uh, enjoy your time in the sun. Thanks for everything. And uh, maybe we'll see each other in the future. Bye now.